We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. So may I just begin by saying uh, what a wonderful day this has been. And so I want to extend a great thank you to all of the speakers who clearly put in tremendous amounts of time into making their ideas and their data uh, accessible to us. Uh, uh, I, I found it really exciting. Um, and I should also just thank all of the people who are out there in Zoom land so I think the way this is meant to work is that people will put in their questions. I think Jean-Pierre, you're meant to ask the questions for the first part. And then since it's terribly late yes. in, in yes. France and you must I be more than ready for a bit. <laughs> I can uh, tell that. I will, do this, I will do the questions for the second half. So okay. over to Jean-Pierre. Yes, so the question is to Frédéric Barrette. What is known about the evolutionary history of psychedelic plants or fungi? Why might these organisms produce molecules that can have such a profound effect on the human mind? Do the molecules have any other known roles for the host or its ecosystem? Indeed, uh, yeah, quite, quite a question. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and, and uh, my, you know, as, as a cognitive neuroscientist and a behavioral pharmacologist, I just have to admit that, that part of the question is a little bit outside of my wheelhouse, but I'll do the best uh, that I can to answer that. So, so I, I am aware that uh, there are anthropological and, and other kind of historical records that people have interpreted as evidence that the psychedelic plants and, and fungi uh, have, have been used throughout uh, history, throughout recorded history. There are often references to Soma and, and, and the notion that Soma itself was, was you know, a classic psychedelic or a psychedelic-like drug. And, and I have to admit that my perspective and, 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 and uh, my appreciation of this is that, um, yeah, maybe, uh, but there's a ton of speculation. And, 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 and there are a lot of these uh, things that, you know, in, in many cases, we're not going to be able to know for sure. Um, I, think, I think we have been able to trace back um, lineages of, of psychedelic mushroom use, you know, a number of centuries, uh, but, but uh, you know, with, without any more firm evidence, there, there, there seem to be just good, compelling possibilities that, that psychedelic-like drugs have been used for far longer than that. Um, and, 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 and whether or not uh, these, these compounds have, have uh, use in the ecosystem, I, I'm, I'm very sorry, I can't really um, you know, answer, answer or address that uh, definitively, but I will say that um, the psychedelic drugs uh, that are being studied these days uh, also may, may not just have the psychoactive properties that everybody seems to be interested in. They may not only have uh, the antidepressant effects and anti-addictive effects that people are, are, are kind of uncovering now, but there's recent research to suggest that uh, psychedelic drugs in small doses can have anti-inflammatory effects, which, which kind of bring it outside of neuropsychiatry into a more broad medical uh, 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 indication space. And so, you know, I can't help but think that, yeah, there, there probably does serve 
some role uh, in, the, in the greater ecosystem than our, than our brains um, for, for psychedelic drugs. Um, so so more, to, more to learn there. Okay, so then there is, a, thank you very much. A question to Thomas Skodas. Um, to what extent do you believe that the religious or ritual vocalization you describe are related to the evolution of language? Is one a prerequisite of, for the other? Or do you two re, or do the two require a similar stage of cognitive or cultural development? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, may I repeat the last uh, second part of the question? Is one a prerequisite for the other, or do the two require a similar stage of cognitive or cultural development? I think I have to, to go back to the idea of, of speculation and to um, a more poetic um, interpretation of the origin of language from human sound or sonorous being. And um, I would say we have to entertain the possibility that in the biblical story of Adam and Eve, um, what Eve ate wasn't actually an apple. Um, it was perhaps encoded as an apple and was really a mushroom because the kind of um, mind expanding, mind altering effects that Adam and Eve experienced uh, could very well have been a reference to a psychedelic substance that um, the divinity didn't really want them to get a hold of. Along with those ideas, the speculative notions of the origin of languages are all also good to think with. You know, it's, it's often been said uh, or it was said in the 19th century, I think, that um, language originated with the sounds of collective labor. That used to be called the yo heave ho theory of language. Um, it was said that um, language may have originated in the sounds of um, lovemaking, uh, which was referred to as the woo woo theory of language. And um, of course, it has always been said that a language may have been originated by song, song that was spontaneous and song that was um, social, also known as the la di da theory of language origin. I don't mean to be um, frivolous about it. Well, yes, I do actually. I just mean to be um, poetic about it because I think we have to have recourse to um, speculation of what makes us human in that sense, as well as in the sense of the um, you know, evolution of our uh, physical, biological, neurological apparatus. Thank you very much. Um, now I have a question to Kenneth Kidd. Could you discuss, speculate about possible positive selection pressures related to population differences in the discus genes, ADH1B47, ALDH2, ACN9, SDHAF3. You mentioned the early emergence of agriculture as a possible commonality between those populations. Could you talk about gene culture co-evolution with regard to alcohol consumption? Well, it's speculation. Um, but one of the things that is common to several of the variants is a high transient level of acetaldehyde. And while a flushing reaction and the negative effects toward drinking um, are quite clear from that toxin, it's also possible that that may have had an effect on certain parasites that apparently don't have their own acetaldehyde that would degrade that intermediate chemical. So that there's some speculation 
that as populations became more dense, parasite loads might be greater, that there would be some benefit in drinking alcohol and eliminating some of your parasite load. It's purely speculation, but it is a good just so story, uh, given that we have no hard evidence of why this is. I'm particularly interested in the um, ACN9. I can never remember the full name of the full new name of the acetate non-utilizing. That's also a mitochondrial membrane protein. And it's interesting to speculate that somehow acetate may be highly involved in functions in the brain. And this is particularly relevant to brain function, not otherwise. And all of this biochemistry raises the point that we're not quite clear what chemical that exists in this metabolic pathway is what causes the mind-altering effects that almost all of us have experienced at some time after a couple of glasses of wine or a couple of glasses of beer. So a lot is unknown. It's a fascinating topic, but clearly we have here a, uh, an inducer of an altered state of mind that is also involved in rituals. Um, so it interacts with a lot of the issues that people have talked about, but it's not clear what the biological phenomena are that's resulted in these variants being so very common in some populations and not others. Okay, thank you very much. And there is a question to me. If the drugs you discuss are so beneficial, why are they not more widespread compared to nicotine or tobacco? Well, first of all, I would like to say that they are not that beneficial in, in a general manner in the sense that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, they have side effects which are uh, extremely important. The most important one is, of course, addiction, uh, as it was uh, discussed for alcohol uh, by George Coob. And uh, this um, uh, issue of addiction is, of course, uh, not only present with uh, tobacco, with all the difficulty you uh, know uh, about uh, lung cancer, uh, but um, uh, these uh, drugs like uh, cocaine uh, are indeed also creating addiction and uh, may have a, a, a huge toxicity if uh, taken systematically and, and for a long period of time. Uh, so I am answering this question by saying first that these uh, other drugs uh, are not so beneficial. Well, some of them maybe more than others and may have therapeutic action. I mentioned that uh, for nicotine. Uh, I also uh, mentioned that for Ritalin, for instance, uh, the nicotine can uh, uh, be of course uh, efficient against uh, uh, loss of uh, cognitive abilities like in Alzheimer and, and so on and so forth. So first, uh, they are not so beneficial. Uh, even though uh, they may have therapeutic application, which is, I think, uh, an important issue. In this respect, I may say that uh, uh, very often these drugs have what is called a dual action. They are for uh, uh, some effects are beneficial and others are detrimental. 
So this is a so-called very general issue about uh, real action of, uh, of drugs. Now the person say, uh, why not uh, more widespread? Uh, I may say that there are already quite a bit widespread and too much, uh, and in particular some of these addictive drugs, uh, and uh, other which are less, uh, still a little bit addictive, are extremely widespread, and one is caffeine, of course. And uh, you may say that, uh, and I close on that, that uh, this is indeed uh, some kind of beneficial drugs, since some people say that uh, enlightenment uh, in Europe, uh, in France and England, Germany, uh, has been possible because of the use of, of coffee. At least there is a, a coincidence between the, uh, the enlightenment philosophers and the, the use of coffee, whether there is a causality between the two, I am not going to say that. There is a, a question now by Georges Koub. If you had to speculate, um, uh, what might have addiction looked like for early modern humans? Would it be similar to modern day humans or would a decreased access to certain plants, chemicals, year round change the way that addiction withdrawal manifests? George, do you, you have the floor. Cool. Okay, so um, again, I, I think this is largely speculation, but this much, um, the, the kind of way this question is often asked is, uh, do animals show addictive properties? In other words, um, do you see addiction in the, in the wild, uh, non-humans? And the answer is, uh, there's pretty good evidence of, of an, most, mostly anecdotal, but of, of intoxicated uh, mon uh, monkeys, intoxicated birds. I've actually seen intoxicated birds and intoxicated tortoises. Uh, I remember when I lived in Pennsylvania, there were these uh, land tortoises that ate the mulberries that were fermenting from the huge mulberry tree in, uh, off of the side of our yard. And they got so uh, intoxicated, they couldn't move out of the area, so they were easily captured. Uh, and there's the talks of, um, of uh, elephants going wild in India who got into the, um, the brewing pots of people who were uh, uh, distilling their own booze. Um, I, I would imagine that if, if when humans figured out distillation, um, which was quite some time ago, or even beer, which was uh, it, 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 um, about the time of the Egyptians, as I recall, there was a beer formulation found in the pyramids, that probably the pattern was very similar. It doesn't really, um, you know, it, it does, with alcohol, it doesn't matter how you take it. Um, you know, you can get just about as intoxicated on 5% beer as you can on 40% uh, liquor. And so my guess is that humans probably got intoxicated with alcohol very early on and showed many of the signs and symptoms that we observe uh, today. About other drugs, I, can all, I, I, I have no idea because um, I, I don't know the history of, uh, of use of, um, you know, in the Mayans uh, allegedly were using cocaine, but it was only the upper class and it was used in ceremonial uh, situations. Whether there's any evidence in Mayan history of, uh, of somebody going on a cocaine binge, I really don't know. That's Thank as far back as I can go. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, uh, George. So the question is to Red Montagu. I was surprised that putamen activity was suppressed for both positive and negative reward prediction error trials in meditators. Can you speculate about how meditation leads to such changes in RPE evoke neural activity. Oh, so the question is, we saw flat responses in the RPEs and the putamen for um, meditators. We, we saw this at two levels. Um, I, I didn't show one of these. One is across cohorts. So we had recruited people into the lab that were sort of already meditators and we recruited match controls. 
And then secondly, in a randomized control design, where we recruited people into a study that had not had any history of meditation and trained them for, um, I think it was nine weeks, we bought trainers and whatnot. And in both cases, the results were the same, which is it blunts these reward responses across categories. Um, I think Helen touched on a, a broader range of this than I did. Um, in that sense, whatever it is we're using to set up the expectation and then look at the error signaling, um, the expectations have to change, otherwise the error signals wouldn't change. And so we, we, um, the best ideas about this come from rodent work, uh, looking at monosynaptic, connect, direct synaptic connections from the prefrontal cortex, and that would be a target for what you're learning to control um, by inducing meditative states. But I would, I would warn that um, what I showed was a very small step. So um, we know that you can change these expectations and meditators did it quite profoundly well. One thing I didn't show was we did the same sort of thing in ratings of um, art, representational and non-representational art. This is about seven years ago. And um, if you exclude art critics who hated everything, um, uh, you can, the meditators um, show, showed a profound effect at sort of not differentially valuing art. And um, I think it just speaks to sort of what got touched on by my talk and, and, and Helen's talk, which is um, it's involved somehow in cognitive control that we appear to be able to um, get control of it in some sense. These, and, and, these, and there are lots of ways in on this. There, there are narratives and religious rituals and cultural conventions, and there are all kinds of ways to ensconce <laughs> this in a culture. So um, I think it's an interesting way in for, because um, it's controlling a very basic teaching signal in your brain. Uh, if you can control that, then you can control lots of things. And so I, um, I see it as a, um, a small step forward toward that. And if I had to guess, which is what I'm doing, um, you would see these structures most readily in the, the prefrontal cortex and maybe in some midline structures. Again, these are networks. And so um, that kind of those kinds of answers are coming with later work. Thanks for the question. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is to Barbara Paris. In thinking about the findings of your study, I could not help but think about women in regions of the world where the light day cycle is vastly different from our own here in San Diego. That is uh, six hours of daylight in northern parts of Sweden. In places such as this, would uh, we expect light therapy so still be as effective? And perhaps this is a silly follow-up but in uh, what way does light therapy distinguish itself from vitamin D? This okay. is the, the question to Barbara. All right, so um, there's much more of winter depression or seasonal affective disorder at northern latitudes compared yes. to the southern latitudes. And uh, so at light therapy, when they first tried to treat this winter depression, they uh, extended the light period, more light in the morning and more light in the evening. So yes, yeah, someone, whether they're at northern latitudes or southern latitudes, um, is, gonna, is just is gonna be responsive to light. Some people think if you're living in San Diego, well, you get more light. Well, actually in the winter, it still gets dark at 5 p.m. So we still have winter depression that responds to um, the light treatment here. Uh, we do find that the, um, the amount of ambient light, I didn't show these data because of just time constraints, but um, you get a more robust response when you have increased amounts of ambient light uh, during the um, summer and the spring, as opposed to winter uh, in the fall. So the, the ambient light enhances the effect of uh, the uh, wake therapy uh, and uh, compounds the effects of also light treatment, so. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Um, and uh, Tavares, uh, many rituals needed to change because of the current pandemic of COVID-19. How do you foresee rituals such as religious services to be changed long term due to the pandemic? Long term change of rituals during pandemic. Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, most uh, religious groups have moved online with whatever kinds of rituals or services that that they perform. Um, in terms, well, I guess one of the things that I could say that has to do with pretty conventional religious activity, it was actually the one that Professor Sordis was talking about, which is singing. One of the first things that got uh, nixed uh, by the pandemic was congregational singing and singing in choirs. And I mean, that clearly has a kind of effect um, on us cognitively when we sing together. And because that's a super spreader kind of event, um, that was cut out. So I can actually, you know, say based on my own experience and people I know, that has been a big loss. Um, but what the groups I know, you know, they have people sing and people can kind of sing with the online service or online ritual, but it's not the same as being together and having the, the feeling of the group when you're actually, your voices are singing together. Um, but there's also positive effects. So people are able to join in these services that are online now in ways that they couldn't do. So it's not so local anymore. So that may be something that some religious groups continue. We'll have to see. Thank you very much. <laughs> the next question is uh, to Ellen Wang. In the intersex intersectional neuroscience framework, how much can and should you generalize from these findings? Is it okay to generalize from the results of the personalized classifiers? And does the inclusion of subjects of diverse identities license stronger generalization of findings? Or is the generalization of findings not desirable at all? Yeah, I love this question. I've been um, struggling with it a lot once I realized that averages in terms of neuroscience may not tell us as much as, as we hope for. Or, or, or I should say that um, there are different ways of looking at it, that you can develop personalized brain classifiers, that you don't have to average brains. Um, so I had my neuroscience existential crisis when I realized averaging all my brains together on my dissertation data set, which had 112 brains, didn't find anything. And I'm like, what did I just do with the last six years of my life? But I think that really generated this um, openness to discovery. I knew compassion, uh, practicing compassion was producing a pretty strong behavioral effect in just two weeks. There has to be neural signals that um, coincide with those behavioral changes. And so if you read the paper, it's in Frontiers in Psychology. It's really a model for opening up the space for considering people and meditators with different perspectives, considering the possibility of what we can do if we include more voices, if we uh, create more methods that, that fit more people that are more adaptable, like this individualized neuroscience approach. And so what I want people to generalize or take away from that is let's open up our frameworks of thinking. Um, it doesn't provide concrete answers on what happens to the brain when we meditate. It's more like each person's neural signals are slightly different. Um, we try to look for generalities. Uh, there was not one voxel in the brain that was predictive of classifying mental states out of 15 meditators in that study. Uh, the most was I think nine or 10 out of 15. So it just shows how our brains represent information differently. Um, and so as a measurement tool, I think that the individualization is really potent. But then what we can do at the general level is that we extract information from the brain based on individualized signals 
and make estimates such as what percentage of the time was this individual on their breath for that particular meditation. And we can um, get those estimates for every single person in the study. And then we can start to look at those extracted metrics at a group level and maybe start to make generalizations. But I always want to question, why are we averaging? What kind of generalization might come out of this? What are we going to do with that information? There are lots of people who don't fit the standard norm um, set by science. And what did those people do with this kind of information? So I just want us to get more flexible. I think if academics, um, researchers talk more with people who do clinical work or field work, um, and we have better dialogues, we can uh, find better communications between the general and the, the personalized. So I hope that helps. Thank you very much. Now, there is a question which is open to all of us. What do we know about the experience of consciousness associated with heavy palliative end of life care? Who wants to answer this question? Is there somebody? I may start and then you keep going. I am not uh, a doctor, uh, an MD, and uh, I am not being uh, really taking care of, uh, of uh, patients uh, under this condition. But what I can say, two things. First of all, that uh, uh, their uh, uh, level of consciousness and the way they react to the outside world is uh, most likely modified by the drugs uh, that they are uh, taking, which usually are <coughs> tranquilizers or uh, opiates or whatever. Uh, that's uh, for sure they don't have exactly the same perception of the uh, outside world as we do uh, under the uh, condition where we are. And um, the second aspect is that uh, uh, there have been studies uh, uh, with uh, uh, patients under uh, coma, <coughs> under the particularly altered states of consciousness by, for instance, Steve Laure in, um, in Liège. And uh, he has been able to uh, describe in details these uh, uh, different states. And what I can say is that, um, first of all, one has criteria to evaluate them. And also one um, can uh, um, have uh, ways to monitor uh, the uh, state of consciousness, like uh, EGs on the out on the outside, or <clears throat> perhaps also, in addition to simply EGs, to uh, study the uh, the complexity, which is uh, now uh, popular in some of our colleagues, uh, the complexity of the signal, and uh, uh, have a, a comparison between a, a patient in uh, fully alert condition and uh, unfortunately uh, brain dead uh, patients and uh, try to uh, locate the uh, uh, level of uh, uh, wakefulness or consciousness to these uh, external uh, physical parameters. Um, somebody wants to complement what I said? Yeah, yeah. So uh, there were uh, there there were a few studies that were conducted. Uh, you know, some of the first clinical studies in the recent era uh, conducted with psychedelic drugs as a therapeutic were conducted in patients who were suffering from terminal cancer or you know late stage cancer diagnosis. And and, and frankly, the um, uh, from what I understand, not being a physician, but from what I understand, uh, one of the most difficult aspects of of such a, a terminal cancer diagnosis treat is the existential threat and dread and, 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 and depression and anxiety that accompany, um, you know, such, such a diagnosis. And, and if, if we can open up our, our, our uh, conceptualization of an altered state of consciousness to in, include that type of existential threat and, 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 and dread, I, I, I would imagine that this is something that we should consider in terms of people who are at the end, end stages of life. And, and, and uh, it was relevant that psychedelics were, were in many people able to help uh, ameliorate these, these experiences, but that's not to say that I, I fully understand them. I just wanted to kind of put a, a pin in that uh, set of experiences. Uh, if somebody wants to contribute, 
uh, I think, uh, Frederic, you should stay. You should uh, be with us uh, still because the next question is for you. Uh, is there any evidence that non-human species seek out psychedelic plants, fungi? I have heard of dolphins consuming toxic puffer fish, which cause hallucination in humans. So I suspect there could be other examples. Certainly, certainly. You know, I was I was thinking of the the toxic puffer fish uh, when when uh, Dr. Kube was responding to his question about intoxication, and and um, yeah, that seems to really be a really uh, really uh, interesting uh, kind of phenomenon. Um, I, I I understand foxes to eat uh, and consume uh, amanita mushrooms, which are not psychedelic in the same way that classic serotonergic psychedelics are uh, psychedelic. Um, you know. Uh, uh, Amanita, amanita mushrooms uh, and fly agaric mushrooms uh, have ibotenic acid, uh, which which yeah, has very different psychoactive effects in humans. But but a, a difficulty in answering that question comes with the difficulty in really understanding the conscious state of of non humans um, and well other humans too. How can I truly know that my conscious experience is any way comparable to, to Dr. Shanjo or any of the other speakers or any of you listening? You know, we, we, we take it on faith that, that our language being shared and our, and our, and our experiences uh, being shared to the degree that we can with language, uh, you know, gives us some sense that our experiences are similar. But I, I think the difficulty in answering that question comes with the difficulty in, in trying to understand what a hallucinogenic experience or a psychedelic experience would, would be for uh, any other species. and. Uh, you, there are many, uh, j just like there are uh, rodent models of antidepressant drug uh, response, uh, such as the forced swim test or, you know, the, 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 the sucrose preference test or test of Andedonian things. Um, the, these are all things that, that humans have figured out that animals do that uh, if you administer a drug that has an antidepressant effect in humans, it will often have a, a change in behavioral effect in animals, but those are not to be understood as models of depression. How, how do you define depression within a, a rat? It's really not, not something that we can do. And in a similar sense, I think it, it's, it's very difficult to, to convince ourselves that we know what a psychedelic experience would be like in, in another species. We have models of psychedelic drug effect in rodents, for instance, um, behavioral assays, such as you know uh, uh, the, uh, the head twitch response. So if you administer a drug to a rodent that in humans would engender a psychedelic effect, uh, very likely that drug will uh, it, engender this behavioral effect in the rodent where they really quickly and, and stereotypically uh, shake their head back and forth, you know, really short first. Um, does that mean that the rodent is having a psychedelic experience? Well, I don't know, but, but uh, you know, I, I think that there are uh, examples of, of, of other species consuming um, you know, drugs that, that have psych psychedelic-like or psychedelic-esque effects in, in humans. Okay. Thank you very we much. I think the time uh, is uh, for me to uh, shift to uh, uh, the chair to Pat. Uh, uh, where is she? Uh, yes, she I'm right here. here. I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so okay. Uh, I, I uh, wish you a good success. I'm uh, Happy to have uh, uh, had this uh, interaction uh, with all uh, our friends and colleagues. And uh, Pat, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. You know, um, I just I want to uh, abuse the privilege of being co-chair by saying I, I'm not sure we should be quite so hesitant to attribute similar states of consciousness, at least to other humans. I mean. And, and at least to other primates. I mean, after all, the brains are very, very, very similar. And um, so, yeah, I mean, we can't say about most things in our empirical experience, we can't say very much with absolute certainty. And I don't think there's anything special about saying when you see someone who just stepped in a terribly hot fire and has blisters all over their feet, that you're pretty darn sure they're in pain and that it's probably not unlike the kind of pain that you have felt when you put your foot in a fire. So, so I know there is supposed to be something so special about consciousness that, you know, all we know is that our own brains have it and everybody else is off the map. 
I'm not sure we should be quite that cautious. Anyhow, I've abused my privilege. And um, so now I have to uh, give a question to uh, Thomas Schorlisch and to Frederick Barrett. And the question goes like this. Music and psychedelics seem in particular to enhance the effects of the other when used together. So music together with psychedelics. This certainly is the 60s experience. Do either of you have thoughts about the ways that the, these would have co-evolved together in human communities? So perhaps Thomas, do you, or Fred, you're here already. Do you want to have a go? Yeah, I, 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 I almost want to defer to Thomas so that I can have a moment to think about that because it's really <laughs> an intriguing question. So I hope that's not too much of a cop out. Um, Thomas, do you have a, a ready, a, a ready uh, provided uh, response? I can say um, just to start with that um, the two examples that I chose to talk about in, in my um, brief presentation, it occurred to me afterwards that one of them has to do with psychedelic substances. The Native American church, uh, peyote songs are sung by people um, who have been inspired to get the songs or inspired to compose the songs under the influence of the sacred medicine and who sing the songs in peyote meetings um, while others are around. They share them with, with, with other people when they are um, um, participating, engaging with, with the medicine. But the other example I gave, which is speaking in tongues among Catholic charismatics, um, it is something that's done without any, any psychedelic drugs. And the point that, that I was uh, trying to make by appealing, by stepping back to um, the idea of imagination and the idea um, that the otherness that's built into our bodily beings is what's being tapped into here um, is a way I think of, of saying, um, let's, think of altered states of consciousness in, 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 in broader terms first, before um, diving in to say that the hallucinogenic substances um, affect our experience of music in, 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 particular, in particular ways um, that are mind altering or mind, mind expanding. Because you know it, it gets us, taking a step backward like that allows us to um, rather than leap to the question of um, our states of consciousness among uh, different peoples of different cultures similar, um, or our states of consciousness um, among people who are using psychedelic substances um, uh, similar to uh, those who are in, in, in trance with other means of induction to use uh, um, and Taves phrase focusing on means of induction or are states of consciousness similar from human beings to other animals, I think we have to take a step back and say, well, first of all, are they comparable even? And let's ask the question, um, are states of consciousness identifiable and comparable? Um, and what would be the criteria for comparison um, on our way to it? asking the question, um, are they similar? But the um, you know, psychedelic substances are um, definitely, I mean, we heard it um, today in our talks, psychedelic substances, uh, psilocybin, um, you know, have a particular kind of uh, resonance with, with music and, um, and that's certainly worthy of, uh, of exploring, but I think I've said enough. Yeah, I, th thanks. Thanks, Thomas. I think those are all really, really important perspectives. I, I guess I'm now just kind of thinking back to some of the research that I've done, um, you know, in, 
in graduate school in psychology, I, I, I spent a lot of time using computational models of music cognition to actually interrogate brain function uh, that was occurring during music listening and, 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 and interrogating the brain uh, networks of brain regions that are involved in representing the abstract structure of music as it evolves over time. Uh, and I, I was fortunate enough to be able to analyze brain data that was collected while people were both listening to music and experiencing the effects of LSD. And, and what, we, what we found was that the LSD really kind of turned up the gain on uh, those brain regions that were, that were tracking this time-varying tonal structure of music. It's almost as if, um, you know, all, all, of the, all of the neural architecture that's involved in, in, in tracking tonality and, and the way that a, a piece of music evolves with chords and key changes and things, um, that was, that was uh, hyper, hyperactive and, and hyper-responsive to music during the effects of LSD. One way to try to interpret that is that, you know, LSD may be, if we want to think of this in this particular causal fashion, LSD may be uh, facilitating uh, deeper listening than a person was uh, you know, engaging in when they had their placebo scan. And, and we can imagine just being a research subject who's sitting in a scanner, you know, you didn't get LSD, you're supposed to listen to this music and wow, I can't wait until I get LSD, right? Maybe, uh, but, and then you get LSD and, 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 and the entire experience is far different. But um, the way I also like to think about this is in terms of deep listening, the way that people describe the way that they experience music uh, during the effects of LSD and psilocybin from, from our, our, our scientific studies, from our, our empirical studies, uh, really, uh, you know, to me as a musician and a musicophile, sounds like deep listening. I mean, I think it's an art that is being lost and I hope it's not lost, but when is the last time that any of you closed the door, you know, lowered the shades, turned off the lights, threw on a, a, a CD or a tape or, or some vinyl, and just lit, close your eyes and listen to, to the record front to back, no other stimulation. It's really an incredible experience. And um, I, I, I guess I, I, the way that this all seems to map out to me is, 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 is an amplification of this primarily human experience that we can all engage in anyway. Um, how this evolved, uh, I don't know if I can touch that, but, but I, when, when, when asked the question of how these things could have co-evolved, I want to appeal to, to Terence McKenna's theory of the stoned ape. Um, and, and, and his, his general suggestion that, well, maybe psychedelic substances helped our species to evolve and, and, and expand kind of cognitively and consciousnessly. And, and, and if we think of, of, of theories of the you know, co-development of, of music and language, the, these things seem to align to me. Yeah, yeah there could be a universe in which uh, psychedelic experiences helped us to evolve language and music uh, and, and that these things co-evolved. Um, but I guess outside of that speculation, who knows? Can I add a couple other thoughts in, in, in response to that? Um, that I was thinking as, as you were thinking, also as a, as a musician myself, um, the issue of synesthesia is relevant in considering um, the interaction between um, music and, and psychedelic substances. And I think we could go uh, pretty far um, discussing that. Uh, not just in metaphorical senses, you know, the color and the tone of, of, of a musical composition. Um, there's also the issue of, of movement, you know, music as, as movement and how that can um, play into the, um, the, the, the gestural sense of, um, of, moving under the influence of a psychedelic um, substance. And so, so there's, you know, there's, there, there's that as well. Um, and, and I'm not thinking of it in abstract terms there. It's not just, again, not just a metaphor, like a movement in a symphony is actually, you know, moving, you know, through the world and the way that's um, um, amplified. And you know, this, the simple sense of um, um, texture, you know, as well, that's, that's there, that the, the, you know, the thickness of experience under the um, influence of a psychedelic substance is also something that can, um, you know, be um, 
but that can be a, a penetration of one's you know, bodily and sensory experience with the texture of music. So um, I think all of those are considerations um, you know, that could be explored in, in a lot of depth, so. Um, Anne, Anne Taves would like to chime in on this. So uh, I have another question lined up, but Anne, uh, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, uh, sure. Just, um, I wanted to add that it seems to me that music, ha music and the movement that uh, Tom Sordis is referring to, both of those can shape the psychedelic experience and give form to it, at least from the kinds of examples I've been reading. And that, for me, raises the whole question of set and setting, because I'm pretty sure at Johns Hopkins, they've got a set music tape that they've been using for a long time. And they're creating a setting that I think is, we could look at as kind of ritualizing the context um, in which the experience is occurring and music's part of that, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, if I could, if I could just respond to that, absolutely. Um, we, we absolutely have ritual built up around psychedelic experiences that, are, that have been, uh, you know, not of our own kind of machinations. That sounds like a good idea. It's really been informed by, by, by some, uh, you know, traditional practitioners uh, along the way. And, 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 and as much as we can reflect a, a, a somewhat secularized ritual, um, we do do that. I, I think that, I think that the set and setting are important uh, facets. I think I think that's commonly accepted, despite the fact that it's not necessarily uh, well empirically uh, explored. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm also kind of drawn to just thinking about you know the, the similarity of, of ayahuasca ceremony uh, you know, to, to the extent that I understand that uh, to other you know ceremonies in, in African traditional religions or syncretic religions or Creole religions, uh, you know, throughout the, the, the Caribbean, um, dance, movement, singing, uh, you know, these, these ritualized songs, they, they, they set the stage. They, they, I, I can't help but think that these are all aspects of induction of altered states of consciousness. Okay, now we have a question for uh, Kenneth Kidd. And the question is this, um, can you relate your findings with regard to the genes specific to Southwest or East Asia? Can you relate that to archaeological evidence of alcohol consumption in those populations? A very you know about how those guys drink. Okay, let me try. Uh, the short answer is no. I don't know how to relate it. But a slightly longer answer is that there clearly is evidence very early on of brewing so that alcohol was used as early in the Neolithic as there seems to be good data. And it's always been part of society. Um, the liquor from brewing was a lot safer than some of the water that could be drunk otherwise. So none of that's related to um, alcoholism per se and isn't related to why the evidence of selection and certain genes being common in those regions, uh, that we simply have to speculate. So I wanted to ask George Kub a question and it goes like this. So allegedly after the um, uh, soldiers and Marines returned from Vietnam, even though they took rather large quantities of heroin and cocaine and so forth. Once they were in a very different environment with very different cues, most, the overwhelming majority of those who had done a lot of drugs in Vietnam stopped. 
And I wondered, is something, first of all, I've, I've always been curious about whether that story is actually accurate or not. But the second part of the question is, does that obtain also for alcoholism? So that if you take someone away from the setting where they go through this uh, particular habit on a daily basis, if you put them in a completely different setting, is it easier for them to stop or do they completely stop? In which case, how do the physiological factors in the brain that you describe, how do they relate to this environmental change? Um, the, the short answer is uh, yes, it's true. And the second answer is uh, yes, it would apply to alcohol. So there were two factors involved as I understand it from the Vietnam experience. One is that the, the, the heroin was very pure in Vietnam, so people could snort it and they could smoke it. And that didn't happen until several decades later in the United States when pure heroin was available. So that was one factor. So they became very rapidly dependent. But the cues that were associated with the drug and the withdrawal from the drug, when they got back to the States, those cues weren't there, nor was the stress. So you have, you have stress driving relapse, which is 60%, 70% of relapse is stress. Um, while most of the world thinks, most of the academic world thinks it's cues associated with the drug. The nice. fact of the matter is, if you go back to Arlen Mar Marlatt's work, uh, yeah. seminal work on alcohol, what really triggers relapse is a negative emotional state. Right. That makes sense. Uh, and then finally, you know, we, we've already been, we've already published several studies showing that we can actually pair a peppermint smell or a lemon smell with a withdrawal in a rat. And we've actually just published a paper last year where we imaged it with, it was in collaboration with Elliot Sting at, at NIDA, we imaged the brains of the rats when they were exposed to just the smell that was paired with withdrawal. And what lights up is my beloved extended amygdala. Okay, so, so the cues will actually trigger a withdrawal-like state. Yeah. Um, we don't know as much about it with alcohol, um, but I, I suspect it would be very, very similar. It's something I'd like to do, but it's a little harder to precipitate alcohol withdrawal and make it uh, paired with a cue. But, um, but as I said, you know, stress, the alcohol field has done a lot of work on stress and stress is a major contributor to, to relapse. Let me just quickly, Pat, let me, let me chime in here too. In addition to cues and stress, um, the issue of culture is also um, relevant because I'm remembering Gerald Levy's uh, book on Indian drinking where he talked about Navajo alcoholism and um, that Navajo drinking practices tend to be group drinking with um, close family members, kin, um, and the way the, the cycle of alcoholism um, played out was that there was oftentimes people just stopped drinking because it was, it was time in their life to stop drinking. Um, and um, the, the roles that they played or the time of life that they have, the ex expectations were simply in Navajo culture, you know, either you stay a, a binge drinker you're drinking with family, or you end up, you know, it's time to stop. And that was the end of it. And we don't have that the same way in our culture, um, not just because of cues and stress, just because of the entire um, complex of meanings associated with, with alcohol. Thank you all for that. And I think that has to be the last question. And I believe that uh, Pascal will, um, chime in here and thank uh, everybody and uh, wish us all a good evening. Pascal, uh, are you there? I'm there. There you are. Wonderful. So, thank you, Jean-Pierre and uh, Pat. Oh, and my to, pleasure. My pleasure. To all the speakers. Uh, I, and I want to thank our um, virtual public, both on this Zoom talk and, and uh, via the video feed, for joining this uh, Carter Public Symposium. And in, in closing, I'd like to um, remind you that this symposium was actually made possible by a major funding by Dr. Ben Cipollini and contributions of many uh, uh, people to CARDA. And of course, I invite you to support us so that we can keep these things completely free and open to people from around the world. So I thank you all very much.
and I wish you a wonderful uh, rest of the day or start of the day in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Bye -bye. You, Thank you. Thank you all very much. <laughs>